Finish up. Team 12. Should we do it in there? Oh, let's, let's go in. It's just... Cool. I think we're live, right? Yes. Thank you all so much for watching, tuning in. Uh, we are above, beyond honored to have these musicians here today. This is really a treat. Um, just for those of you who don't know, Mr. Bobby Previtt, Mr. Steve Swallow, Ross Jamie Saff. We're going to jump right into some questions, if that's cool with you. Great. Great first set. And this is Johnny Grizakis, the music seller. This is the music seller, and we have Alex Harney behind the camera making it all happen. Yeah. I'm going to jump right into some questions if that's cool. Um, Sam McGarity, local musician, really was a fan of the Cowboy Bebop and the Yoko Kano stuff and wants to know, Bobby, could you talk a little bit about the music for that? For the what? Cowboy Bebop, did you do some music for some anime? Someone knows more See, than, I, than I do. I, yeah, you know, <laughs> when you get good. to be this age, you know, there's like, <laughs> you you forget a lot of the things that you've done. I don't even remember that. In fact, I think, was that like maybe 25 years yeah, ago? Yeah, it would have been about. Yeah, okay. I remember those sessions. They were because they were at, um, uh, um, you know, what's his name? It's in New Jersey, Rudy Van Gelder. Wow. You know, Rudy Van Gelder Studios, wow. and like Rudy Van Gelder was, you know, of course, insane, crazy person, and he had the white gloves. All I remember about the session is he had the white gloves, and then he wouldn't let you, he had two separate speaker systems, and like you couldn't go, there was no, like a little line on the floor, and that might as well have been, you know, the Great Wall of Giant, because you could not pass that wall. That was his territory, and then you would listen here. You couldn't like walk over here. You could, it was he was pre pre COVID. He was, he, was doing, he was doing he was doing social distancing. But anyway, yeah, I I barely I barely remember those sessions. But um, I guess they were fun. I never saw the anime. I should say. Amazing. Uh, Luke Beeman also wanted Luke Beeman from the Vandal Special wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about uh, working with Tom Waits. Oh sure. Okay. Well, you know. Um, all, what I remember about that was Tom was like, it was like your classic like studio experience, like the ten thousand dollar joint, where it, well, not like a joint was there, but like you know you got the joint and then t three days later he'd come in and he'd bring a little tape recorder and go, yeah, can, I want, can you cop this groove, Bobby? You know, and this is kind of scratchy Frank Sinatra tune, you know, that we'd be trying to listen to, you know, but he really liked the feeling in the studio. Um, when things weren't like set, he would do everything possible to make sure. And if things were set, he would mess it up so that they weren't set. Um, but that was really fun. Rebo was on those sessions, 
And um, and your part is so critical to that tune. It's clap hands and it's the marimba and it's so fucking Bobby Previtt. Every dripping with Bobby Previtt. Well, I didn't even know you, and I knew that track. It was so in me. But, but, do, 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 right. but, do, do, Bobby Previtt like bass the marimba, track. Right. Bass marimba. And then I meet you, and of course you played that track, and it's so you. It's funny because, you know, I did this, you know, so, I worked with soul percussion, one of the greatest percussions in the world, practically. They're like miles above me as a percussion. I'm a terrible marimba player, and I was playing bass marimba, and I was like, I'm the worst marimba player on earth. And he said, you know, make something up. So I made up that line. And then when I heard the record, it was mixed so loud. It was, it was, Makes it became track. like the, yeah, the signature part in the signature record of Tom Waits. And I was working with Soul Percussion for weeks. And they knew me from all this other stuff at the downtown. But it's only when they realized, wait a minute, that was you who did the marimba part? That's our favorite marimba part in the world. It is. <laughs> yeah. it is. It's, it's definitive. And it's completely your music in that yeah, other yeah. zone. Yeah. It makes the track. Yeah. That was wild. Brilliant. Uh, Steve, Sam would also like to know uh, if you could talk a bit about your initial calling to pick up the electric bass guitar. You were playing upright, of course, a lot. Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, well, it was really something that happened to me. It wasn't anything that I did. And if I had it to do, I'd take it back in a minute. But I had no... <laughs> No choice at all. The electric bass found me, really. I, uh, uh, I just happened to pick one up one, one day after years of resisting touching an electric instrument and uh, fell in love immediately. It took, took uh, a split second for my destiny to, to swerve catastrophically toward this, <laughs> toward this new life I wow. had. I love it. When was that, Steve? 1970. It's Frankfurt. been a long time, this new life. I'm hoping to get yet another one any day now. <laughs> and it should be noted uh, that Steve played in Europe in, I think you said it was 59? Yeah. With uh, Charlie Kyle, Dr. Charlie Kyle, Kyle, who is a big part of keeping the music seller's lights on. Incredible. Um, Zach Rudis in Spain wants to know, generally for the three of you, these are difficult times for music in many ways. What do you see that makes you feel hopeful for the future of music? What do you go? You're uh, a hopeful, of course, you're a hopeful yeah. guy. Go ahead. Yeah, it's yeah. super hope. Um, I can. I, I certainly uh, feel this moment here at the Music Cellar very deeply, and I think the younger generation, people like Johnny G and Alex Harney who are running production for us today, but who run this amazing spot, the Music Cellar. Like, that's the future, that's some positivity. And this place, um, I really feel, sort of fills a need here in this community, and it's a place for young people to have a place to be creative and find their musical voice, but just be themselves and, uh, you know, it's such an amazing resource. So I see the hope right here with the young people. I just, I want to just say one thing, it's, it's just quite an amazing experience for me to hear Jamie Sapp, <laughs> who oh, I, me up who I brought to Europe when he was just a young pup, wow. like his first, well maybe my I was first, No, my first, first, my first tour in Europe for sure was with Bobby when I was... 21 or 22, yeah. 93, yeah, 94. To hear, to 94. hear Jamie Sav speak of the younger generation, I'm not, I think I'm going to have a. Where's the ambulance? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not the, I'm not the younger generation. No, anymore, no, you're not. Well, what does that make me? Okay, next question. <laughs> we have time for a couple more? Yeah. Um, any general question? Any uh, modern artists, people who are putting stuff out today that are turning you up, turning you guys on, exciting you? This also comes from Zach in Alicante, Spain. Ooh, Alicante, nice town. Yeah, I believe he's in Murcia. Oh, Alicante, really cool. I played there years ago. It's a really, really beautiful place. Yeah. Hey, Jamie, I think, you know, you're, you're <laughs> new artists that excite me. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, these guys excite me. <laughs> Steve Swallow and Bobby Preston. Yeah. I don't know if you're quite new artists, but uh, you know, I just We're feel so lucky. Old. We're the same old artists. <laughs> and yet, every time, Steve, it's different. Every time, it's deeper. I'm so lucky to get to play with you cats. Steve. Uh, <laughs> that's it. That, that, that's a swerve. That's not yeah, that's, an answer. That's, well, a Steve, that's a right. Go ahead, John. <laughs> that definitely. <laughs> we'll accept it, though. That was yeah. a graceful swerve. That was. We really put it. So you get it back. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead, John. Sam McGarity wants to know if Steve, Mr. Steve Swallow, has a favorite John Schofield album that he worked on. Uh. Or that you didn't well, work you know, on. I'm kind of, I'm kind of <laughs> Or that you didn't maybe, work on. Maybe you have a favorite one that you're not on, Steve. I like a lot of the ones you didn't play on. Yeah. I, I, I love the, the series that he made with Dennis Chambers and, and Gary Granger. Those are gorgeous, well-realized albums. And in a sense, I was on those albums because I produced them. And, and I, I have a, a special fondness for them because I spent so many nights mixing those wow. things with Joe Furler, the, the remarkable engineer. The master. Uh, so, I, so I do feel in a, in a sense that I was on those albums, Absolutely. even though I didn't play a note. And they, they were really, uh, really on fire and, and Skull was really uh, deeply committed to what he was doing. That's not to say that he, he isn't now, but... but uh, Things seem to converge during the making of those albums in, in a very special and fortunate way. And a non-musical question, uh, Steve. Uh, did you mention something about a scuba diving mask? Was yeah, that, uh, I did. You, do you scuba dive? Um, I don't scuba, but I snorkel. Snorkel? I, I snorkel avidly. In and, Woodstock? Uh, yeah, in the bathtub. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be amazed. What's Where do you go there? to do that? Uh, sometimes to the Caribbean, when I'm very lucky I get to do it in the Caribbean, and I've been doing it for long enough to, to, to just to kind of cast a call over the evening. I've been doing it long enough to, to see the coral reefs uh, disintegrate, to, to die down, down there, uh, just to, to, to sound the alarm where everybody else is also sounding. It's, a, it's a drastic situation that, wow. I, that I've been witness to for the last 20 or 30 years, watching the, the reefs turn white. <laughs> and it, it's an irrefutable symptom of, of warming. So I'm hoping everyone can hear the audio at home with the camera microphone. Steve's can I talking ask about a question. Do I yes, get a please. question? <laughs> yes. We're going to go can to I Sap. ask a question of Steve Swallow and Bobby Private? Yes. I would like to know how you guys met. I, I can tell you, Steve doesn't remember. No, I mean, because not because he, he not because he can't remember his memories bad. Because he doesn't. You know, it's not important. I don't care. It's, a, it's not an important event. Like text no, text but for me, um, it was at the um, Detroit Jazz Festival. And I walked up to Stephen Collar. We were playing right after them, and they were off stage. And I walked up. First, I walked up to Carla, and I. Before I got a chance to say anything, Carla said, oh, we hate you. <laughs> I was like, okay. I said, no, because your music is, is too good. We hate you. And, I was, and, then, and then, I met, then I met Steve, and I said, you know, you know, I said that stupid thing that I never usually say anymore to people, but, you know, then I would still be stupid enough to say it. I said something like, hey, we're going to play together someday, you know? No, and you're still... You're still I'm still stupid, stupid enough, enough to say that. You yeah, sure. and, but Steve said, sure, call me. I said, really? He said, yeah, call me. And so I did, and he said, sure. And then what followed was many years of touring with uh, Bump the, uh, with, uh, Bump the Renaissance. Yep. And uh, all I remember was, uh, it was it was incredible. I won't tell the story of our first gig together, though, because it's, you know, a little embarrassing for Steve. I don't want to embarrass Steve. It's but, kind of a long story. Too. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of a long story. But suffice to say, one of the greatest moments I ever had on tour was walking through the Berlin train station at midnight with Steve Swallow going to our sleeper car 
where we were jetting off to somewhere deep in the Eastern Bloc, and we were walking, you know, everyone else was in the car, I guess, and we were the last ones. And I just had that realization, you know, when you have in your life, you realize where you are, you know, what you're doing. I said, I'm walking through the Berlin train station <laughs> on the way to our car with Steve Swallow. It was just beautiful. And that night, Steve held court. I'll never forget it. He told us all kinds of great jazz war stories all night long in our car. It was wonderful. But, uh, yeah. Amazing. 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 I think I can confess now, now would be a good time, none of those stories were true. <laughs> <laughs> Not a single one. You know? Got any other questions, Johnny? Yeah, there's a few here. If we've got time, that's great. We do. Um, Steve, can you tell us a bit? I'm a huge Bethany fan. Um, I'd love to hear anything that sticks out about working with him, maybe what record you record you were involved with, and if you know what the deal is with the striped shirt. <laughs> no, I don't know what the deal is with the striped shirt. That's as much a mystery to me. Can as I tell you what I heard? What? He said in an interview that it was so he doesn't have to think about, it's one less thing to think about before he goes on stage. I think that's likely true. I mean, <clears throat> that, I, in fact, that, that has the, the ring of truth. Uh, the album I like very much is, is, is the one that I played on the, of of, of him and John Schofield together with, uh, with uh, Bill Stewart, the drummer, and, and, and me. Is that I Can See Your House from here? Yes. Oh, I love that record. Yeah, it's a good one, I think. And and, uh, and that that was a lot of fun, uh, making that album. It, it was essentially a live project, and I, I think that's maybe why I like it and why I like Pat's playing so much on it, too. Uh, because it was unpolished. Uh, uh, the idea from the very outset with that project was to just kind of capture us uh, with our clothes off. And uh, that's kind of the, the mood and the, and the feeling in that record that I think makes it a very good Papathini record. He tends to, to, to not trust himself enough, in my opinion, and mm. to kind of polish his performances, his recorded performances, mm -hmm. um, until they really gleam, and it's a beautiful thing how they how they gleam. But I but I love hearing the uh, hearing what he does when uh, when it's un unfiltered, unbleached, unpasteurized, all all of that stuff. He, uh, he, he could, of course, just trust himself and go for first takes, and he'd still be a wonderful, yeah, know, a wonderful, wonderful player. Yeah. So that's a great record. You should all check out um, Pat Metheny, John Schofield, Mr. Steve Swallow. Uh, beautiful record called I Can See Your House From Here. Um, we've got another question for Mr. Previtt. Um, how did the Dead City Radio album come together. It says a record you did with William S. Burroughs. This is oh, from oh, Sam yeah, the Burroughs, and Lincoln. The Burroughs record. Oh, I, I'll tell you a story about Joe Furla since we talked about Joe Furla. And um, on that record, uh, Lenny Pickett called me for that record because I knew Lenny he, after Tower Power. He came to New York and, and I called him and he was because he wasn't doing anything. He, he said, sure, I'll come and rehearse with you every single week without a gig for a year. I said, I'm going to start a band and rehearse every week. But I don't want to work for one year. Wow. And he said, okay. okay. And he did it. Um, but on that session, this is when I realized Joe Furla was, I wanted to work with Joe Furla because everyone was there. Wilner was there, the producer, Furla, all these people in the room. And I was playing chimes. I'll never forget it. And like, Joe was the engineer. And he couldn't get a good sound on the chimes. Now, Joe Furler is a genius engineer, but when is he going to have a close mic a chime? <laughs> Never, right? Unless he's working with a percussion ensemble or a chamber group. Even in an orchestra, you don't close mic the chimes. So he had no idea. So instead of like hot, trying to hide it or, you know, put a lot of EQ, he, or coming out and whispering to me or what do you, you know, what do you, he just hit the talkback mic so everyone could hear and said, Bobby, keep my ear, you know me. I said, yeah. Because I've been playing for a while. I said, do you have any idea how to mic those things? 
<laughs> Joe Furlow. And I said, I just did because I had been in percussion ensemble for years when, when wow. I was a percussion major. I said, well, actually, I think they mic'd him from behind because he had it mic'd from the front. He said, oh, okay. And he came out, he, ch he changed the mics, he went back in, I played for five seconds, and he said, thank you very, very much, that's a lot better. And I went, this guy is a badass, and I want to work with him. Because wow. now he knows. And so everybody out there, never try to hide what you don't know. It's like, because the only way you can grow and learn anything is by admitting, hey, I don't know that, you know? Well, how do you do it? So anyway, that that's my story for that. That's incredible. Joe Furlow. Yeah. Joe Furlow. Joe uh, engineered our first record together as a trio, mm -hmm. the new standard. That's right. What yeah. else has Joe done? Oh. Roberta Flack Roberta and Flack. Donnie Hathaway. Yeah, right. Pretty sure he engineered Killing Me Softly. Yeah. He's, I have Joe's snare drum from that session. Whoa. Right. I have this. Joe he used, used to bring for years a on super, everything we did. Yeah. A super sensitive snare drum. Um, on every session, but he wouldn't say anything. He'd wait till the drummer was like, till they were having a crappy snare drum sound, right? Which was all the time, apparently, according to Joe. Right. And then he'd just let it slip. You know, I have this snare drum here. And the drummer would say, oh, let me try it. And they'd try it to be beautiful. And then one day, he just, for some reason, he just said, Bobby, I think we should have this snare drum. Wow. I was like, what? And he, and he gave it's it to me. It's the snare from Killing Me Soft. Yeah. Oh, incredible. Yeah. Joe is a true master. And, yeah. you know, Bobby tells that story about Joe um, and the miking of that. Well, I learned so much about what I know engineering from people like Joe, but specifically Joe. And, yeah. you know, I, st I met Joe first with Bobby in Europe 20 years ago making a record. Um, EMI Studios, EMI Marveg Studios yeah. in Cologne, Cologne, Frankfurt. Yeah, 22 hours straight, Joe sat at the console. An incredible uh, story. Not hours. just that, but there was no meters at all on the console. So he only had meters, it was analog, to the tape machine. Right. And Joe was going direct to two track on the mixes, and he only had meters on the tape machine behind him. So he's like this, mixed the whole session, with his head backwards, it was like this yeah. super gorilla situation. And, you know, Joe was always so incredibly generous with his knowledge in the studio. So when I was on Bobby's sessions, I would go and ask him questions. People would go outside at the break, and I would go right. to Joe and be like, dude, how do you mic the snare like that? I And Joe taught me how to mic a Leslie. You know, yeah. most people um, do funny stuff with a Leslie, but Joe told me to think of it just as any other instrument. It's just capture the sound of it. So find a nice stereo pair where it sounds nice and you're good. Jo you Joe, know? I, we, we probably should play, but Joe said the single most heaviest thing anybody ever said to me, ever, about music. Literally, Joe Furlow. Because one day we were mixing one of my stupid records from the 80s, which I had like on 24 track tape machine, but I had 49 instruments on them. So like I had six instruments per track and Joe would have to mute it and change the EQ on the fly for the next instrument that came in and it had no relation to the instrument that was going. Okay, so one day there was a guitar solo because there's always a guitar solo. There was a guitar solo and Joe just literally didn't have enough hands to, to ride it and need riding, right? 30 second guitar solo, seven minute two. And he was really frustrated. He said, Joe, I can do it. Just let me ride the guitar solo. That's all? Just, that's all? He said, yeah, if you can just ride the guitar solo, everything else is cool. He's doing all this stuff, right? No computer. Great. We do the mix. He's doing all this stuff. I'm just riding, really kind of riding the guitar solo. We get to the end. We listen to it. Everything Joe does is perfect. The guitar solo is totally screwed up. It's just wrong. It's just wrong. And I'm going, oh, it's obvious. I'm sorry, Joe. He said, okay, let's do it again. Do it again. Everything, seven minutes. I'm now I'm really concentrating. I'm, like, get this. I'm, I'm riding it. I'm, everything I have. And you get to the end. Everything Joe does is perfect. The guitar is always worse. It's worse. I'm like, oh, my God. And then he says to me this. Joe Furless says, wait a minute. Wait a minute, Bobby. When you're riding the guitar solo, you're not listening to the guitar, are you? 
I was like, uh, of course I'm listening to the guitar. I'm writing a guitar song, concentrating on the guitar. I said, no, no, don't listen to everything else, but don't listen to the guitar. Listen to everything, but don't listen to the guitar. And I was like, oh my God. You know, God has just, like, I just was like, and I did it. I just listened to the music, the gestalt, like the, the sound, and it was perfect. And I'll never forget that for the rest of my life. That was the greatest lesson anybody ever taught me about music. Right. Don't listen to yourself. <laughs> right? Right. Or what you, you, the, the more you concentrate on yourself, the worse it is. Really deep. Wow. Awesome. <laughs> Great right. word. Gestalt. Yeah. Excellent story, Bob. All right, should we go back yeah, to music? Yeah, well, set number two? Yeah. Yep. Okay. We'll be right back with some more music.
Roswell Rudd. Oh, oh. That's a Roswell Rudd team.
see. Uh, is it still red stuff? [laughs] Um, yeah. Maybe it's cuz it's a new game and it's兼Oh yeah, yeah. Jazz ballad later. Yeah, m- maybe c- Did they do it yet? Keep it down? Sure. Or Yeah, why not? Yeah. And then we'll do a rain party. We we still got a little ways to go. Oh yeah, we still got a whole lot. Oh. We got seven songs, eh? So, couple more to go. And we're jazz ballad later. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Let's just get the flow going. [laughs] [laughs] This
feel like me. Great. That's what we like. Great. Yeah. Or do we have um Well we did all the ones from the photo shop, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> let's do uh yeah. Let's do Robocop. Or do you wanna start it off, Brian? No.
an ending out of somewhere. Yeah. This uh, this should be our last one, right? This is our last one. Thank you. Thank Aww. you so much. Thanks to Johnny G Thanks on the Johnny organ. Johnny G.
yo sé 